Hello and welcome back. Today is lecture four and we're going to discuss vector-borne infections. Vector-borne infections are a combination of many different diseases and we're going to get into some of them uh, throughout this lecture. I'm not going to be discussing all of them because there's so many of them, but I wanted to give you a taste of some of the major ones that, uh, that, that affect the uh, public health of different developing countries. Um, the ones that I don't discuss, I'd be very happy if you guys, if any of you choose to do that for your particular uh, discussion topic, uh, for your disease specific um, presentations, I'd, I'd be very interested to see them as well. Uh, we're just going to move on now and we're going to start immediately. And let's go here just a second. There we go. So, what is the world's deadliest animal? Yeah, it's the mosquito, obviously. Um, a lot of people might disagree with that statement, saying that the mosquito is not actually killing the people, uh, it's, but it's transmitting the diseases. And then some people might even uh, disagree with it even further and saying, well, the deadliest animal is actually humans. Um, but for purposes of public health, I'm going to go with the statement that saying the mosquitoes are the deadliest animals. So what are vector-borne infections? Vector-borne infections are diseases that are caused by pathogens that are transmitted by either insects or ticks um, that have long impacted human affairs. They've been around pretty much since the beginning of mankind. Uh, they've, been, they've affected uh, the course of, of, uh, human, of human history. Um, some of the major notes are uh, Alexander the Great. Um, some people believe that he actually was infected with uh, malaria um, during, during his conquests in what is now Iraq, Mesopotamia area. Um, and that would, some people speculate that's how he actually died. Um, more well accepted is the idea of what happened in Europe in the Middle Ages, uh, the Black Death that happened that was caused by bubonic plague. Um, which was, um, it, it's a bacteria, free me, it's a bacteria that's uh, born on um, tiny fleas, uh, and they can actually be transmitted from the mice and so on. So this is actually a disease that is also a vector-borne disease, um, and basically wiped out tens of millions of people throughout the world, but a good chunk of European history was affected by, by uh, Black Death. If you're interested in the combinations of history and, uh, uh, and um, infectious diseases, um, there's a lot of good sto stories about Black Death and how it actually affected the entire course of, of uh, European history from the Middle Ages all the way into the Renaissance. Um, and so that's, a, that's just one of the uh, couple of the examples of how vector-borne infections um, moved throughout hist history and affected human civilization. Uh, today, however, vector-borne diseases are um, caused by parasites and pathogens um, and about a billion cases every year leading to one million deaths uh, annually uh, throughout the world are affected. Um, the vector-borne diseases account for about 17 percent of all infectious diseases and their distribution is determined by complex dynamic of environmental and social factors. Uh, basically what, the, what that's saying is, is the environmental has a lot to do with temperatures, uh, the amount of rainfall, where for instance mosquitoes, where they, where they live, uh, we're going to talk about malaria and some of the zones that malaria can exist, um, but we'll talk about it for some of these other diseases as well. And then social factors. Poverty, um, like many infectious diseases, is a huge impact on vector-borne infections. Globalization is also a big factor. Uh, the diseases that have uh, host parasites or host um, reservoirs that might be in one area, uh, with globalization and trade, uh, can easily now migrate uh, over um, large distances. A lot of these diseases um, originally in the Americas, for instance, uh, they were transported by rats uh, on the ships that came in and it would take several weeks to get to, to the, um, the Americas. Now you can do a flight and you can have uh, a new infectious disease pop up within a couple of days uh, um, and become rampant. Some of these new ones that are popping up in the, in the, um, in the western world is Chikayunga, which is um, you know, an ancient disease that, that never really affected the Americas uh, and is now becoming a problem in, in the Caribbean and even some degrees in the United States. Uh, changes in agricultural practices due to variation in temperature, rainfall can affect transmission, and climate change can also have a big factor on it. So we'll discuss all of those um, in detail a little bit later in, in other classes and in other course uh, lectures, um, but also a little bit in this lecture. They generally, uh, what's interesting about vector-borne disease is the vectors themselves, um, the reservoirs, actually usually don't become ill. The mosquito doesn't get sick from it. Um, however, it can damage some of the uh, organs, but they will not, uh, that allows them to actually transmit it a little bit and um, uh, to humans um, and so on. 
Um, but generally, they don't typically die from the actual infection. They usually don't get uh, pathogenic uh, manifestations from the infection. The, uh, the person, the human getting infected or the animal getting infected from the, res from the vector is what actually ends up causing the disease state. So what are some of these diseases, and what are some of the uh, vectors that exist? Um, by, in large, by far, the biggest one, as I just mentioned, are mosquitoes. Um, they are over 3,000 species worldwide. Not every single one of them ca causes diseases. Um, they are um, several, several species of the Aedes and the, um, and the uh, um, Aedes aegyptis fire, uh, mosquito can cause disease. But they all cause diseases such as some of the famous ones, malaria, yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, Rift Valley fever. Chikungunya, uh, Japanese encephalitis, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, um, Eastern equine encephalitis, and so on. Uh, but they are one of the biggest problems that exist uh, for vector-borne diseases. They're not alone. Uh, sand flies are another one. Uh, they are closely related to mosquitoes. Um, they're blood feeders, and they breed in caves. Uh, sand flies will typically be in, um, I wouldn't say, uh, a little bit more of a drier climate, um, but they they uh, they can bite and they do create problems. And the main one is leishmaniasis, and we'll talk about that one as well. Black flies uh, are a type of um, almost like a house fly to, to what we what we see in the states, uh, but they do bite and they uh, are the main cause of river blindness and onchocerciasis, um, and they're primarily found in. Uh, Western Africa now, um, but there are pockets of these these uh, parasite these um, vectors that cause the parasite blindness um, that can be found in the Americas. They are not seen in Asia, um, and they are not seen in Australia. Kissing bugs. Uh, this is something that's found uh, primarily in the Americas. Uh, they are caused by this. They, these bugs can be pretty big. Um, and they are typically found in structures of thatched roofs, um, and they usually bite um, during the nighttime when you're sleeping, and they leave this little tiny um, mark on your skin that almost looks like a, like a little kiss, almost like it's just a little bit of a red spot um, when they when they actually bite you. But they can cause a disease called Chagas disease. And then lastly, ticks. Uh, ticks. Sorry, ticks um, are well. They are a type of uh, arachnid, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and they have a longer life cycle than a mosquito, but they will typically bite you, and they can cause specific diseases called the tick-borne encephalitis, Lyme disease, and tick-borne relapsing fever. These diseases can actually be quite um, complicated to treat um, and very difficult to uh, prevent. But we'll talk about some of those as well. So what are the vector-borne diseases? As I just mentioned a couple of them, but the big ones that you need to know um, are primarily the mosquito-borne diseases. And as I mentioned before, they're mostly caused by Aedes. Uh, the, other, the other species of mosquito is called Anopheles, forgive me, I just remembered. Um, and, but also Culix. So these are three major species of mosquitoes that can cause different diseases. And they have different biting cycles. They have different uh, um, biting times. Um, and they have different infectivity of uh, depending on the species, uh, the specific species of Culex and Ophelis or Aedes for each of these diseases. You won't need to know how infective each of them are for the individual uh, diseases for this course, but just know that there's different species and they have different um, different uh, infectivity in which how they, how they actually bite. Uh, I mentioned before sand flies, ticks, uh, the Chagas bugs, uh, black flies, and the other one I didn't mention before, but is worth mentioning, are aquatic snails. Uh, these snails are typically found on the, on the sides of rivers. Uh, and they kind of hang out on the reeds, um, but they can cause a disease called schistosomiasis. We're going to talk about uh, malaria in a separate lecture. Um, that's going to be a whole lecture unto itself. But three other diseases, lymphatic filariasis, onchocerciasis, and schistosomiasis, I'll talk about in another lecture called the neglected tropical disease one. Um, there are many of these diseases I'm not going to get into specifically, as I mentioned before. Please, if you're interested, feel free to use this as your disease-specific um, talk. I'd be very willing and very eager to see what you have to say. So let's get into some of these diseases. The first one I'm going to discuss is trypanosomiasis. It's also called human African uh, sleeping sickness. Um, this particular disease is found only in Africa, um, but it has a very dis dif different uh, distribution depending on which species is actually the one infecting. 
Um, the East African uh, strain is often called uh, the uh, um, Rodenciasis. Um, it was a uh, basically it's a uh, one one particular species that causes it in the southern uh, half of uh, Africa on the eastern side. And you can see um, some of the countries affected include the, um, uh, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, um, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. Um, and then the other version is the Gambanese version, which is um, found in mostly in Western Africa, but also a little bit of southern Southwest Africa, including uh, Congo, uh, Niger, uh, Nigeria, and so on. Some of these countries in the in the south in the um, curve of Africa, the Southwest curve of Africa. Um, so they do have different geographical uh, areas that they that they can infect, and as you can see, it's caused by this parasite. Um, that caught the trypanosomiasis, um, which is transmitted by the tsetse fly. Um, some of the general symptoms include, and this is why it's called sleeping sickness, is drowsiness during the day, anxiety, um, and insomnia in the night. So, I mean, you can get this sleepiness uh, that is the major characteristic of it. However, it's not the only one, but includes things like headache, mood changes, sweating, and get swollen, swollen lymph nodes. Um, and then uh, you get all these, all these nodules where the actual um, TZ fly bites. Uh, so it's just general malaise that you know can occur for a long period of time. Um, it occurs in over 36 sub-Saharan African countries where the TZ flies transmit the disease and people are most exposed um, that live in the rural areas, the agricultural or fishing areas where these TZ flies tend to live. The Gambanese version accounts for 98% of the reported cases, um, so it is the bigger problem uh, in the number of reported cases, but geographically it's about equivalent. The sustained control uh, efforts have lowered the number of cases in 2009. There was a reported case uh, drop from 10,000 um, for the first time in 50 years, and in 2012 it was 70, 7,200. There are the WHOs leading this um, sleeping sickness uh, um, campaign to prevent it, but also treatments, uh, quick, fast treatments to prevent the spread from person to person um, as, a, as within a community. Uh, it's part of the neglected tropical disease branch of the uh, WHO, and a lot of the um, drug producers are donating some of the drugs that are produced. And some of the drugs listed here, I'm not going to go over each of them, but um, they do uh, are available. Um, these are very old drugs. They are have a lot of problems to them. There's a lot of side effects. So a lot of people do not like to take them, um, and you know they do cause a lot of problems in and of themselves. Diagnosis and treatment of the disease is complex and requires specifically skilled staff. Uh, you have to deal with weight issues. You have to deal with hydration issues. Um, there are long periods of time that these drugs need to be taken, so it's not an easy regimen to deal with. But um, it does it can cure the person for the disease. Um, and so, you know, it's what we got. There are research efforts going on right now for um, both vaccines as well as uh, new, new, new generation drugs for this. And hopefully in the near future, those will actually be coming online. The next disease I want to discuss about is leishmaniasis. Um, leishmaniasis is basically, it's caused by a sand fly, uh, another fly that we mentioned earlier. And you can see that the distribution here is fairly worldwide. Um, there's two major kinds of it, the cutaneous form and the visceral form. And basically, very simply, uh, the cutaneous form causes these nodules that tend to, uh, boils that tend to come up on the skin. They can be all over the skin. But because of the boils that actually happen, um, cutaneous leishmaniasis has developed the term called a couple of them, but one of them that comes to mind is the Baghdad boil. Um, a lot of soldiers that went to the Middle East uh, during the um, uh, first and second Iraq war, uh, basically got some of these leishmaniasis uh, diseases, um, pustules that came from the cutaneous version. The more severe version, which you actually will see a lot in, in countries like India, um, but also Ethiopia and Brazil, so it's worldwide, it's not, not necessarily localized. Um, the visceral version is a major problem because what happens is, is you actually get the liver infestation and this can actually uh, be much more lethal. Um, we can talk about some of the signs and symptoms. The cutaneous version, as I mentioned before, causes these uh, pustules or ulcers on the exposed skin, um, while the uh, um, while the here we go while the visceral version uh, cre creates a widespread uh, systemic disease characterized by darkening the skin, um, uh, 
hepatosplenomegalia, uh, which basically means the liver and the spleen are, um, are uh, it, it swollen, um, and that can cause major problems. But also, you can get these um, nonspecific abdominal tenderness, fever, fatigue, malaise, headache, um, and this is very, it can get actually to the point where it actually gets life threatening. Uh, visceral leishmaniasis also has another name, Kala Azar, uh, which is um, uh, a characteristic name that you might see as well. This also has a couple of different treatment options. Um, I'm not, the four here are mentioned. Um, basically, they are also very old, very uh, first generation drugs that have been around for many, many years. Um, new drugs are coming online as well. These are also within the NTD programs um, that are trying to develop these. So a lot of these drugs, you know, there's no market necessarily for them, for the drug manufacturers to make, so they are doing a lot of these manufacturers for donation programs. Um, we'll talk about some of the donation programs in the NTD lecture, but uh, just be aware that this is also in that program. There's a lot of connections between HIV and Calazar or leishmaniasis. Um, it's, been, it's been emerging as one of the major opportunistic infections for HIV-infected um, people. Um, more than 1,000 cases of HIV and leishmaniasis are reported from 25 countries. Um, however, in India, it's not yet a serious problem, um, but India, is, because it has such a high amount of leishmaniasis, um, if HIV rates start to increase, this could become a major problem. Uh, it is the first opportunistic infection in asymptomatic HIV persons, but it can also occur uh, at the advanced stages of AIDS and, and can be one of the causes of death. Like a lot of the other control programs for these different diseases, vector control uh, through insecticidal spraying is important. Um, you can use DDT uh, for up to six feet of height from the ground twice annually. Um, DDT is very controversial. We'll discuss some of the problems with it in the malaria lecture in a little bit more detail. But uh, historically, it was used um, in, the th in the tons that they would basically spray on fields uh, because of what was going on in the 1960s with uh, some of the uh, environmental concerns about it. It was withdrawn, and now the recommendations are to basically do residential spraying. Um, very small amounts is still within reason. But some of the other controls are early, early diagnosis and treatment completion um, give you the best diagnos diagnosis for, for uh, survival. And then capacity building, basically allowing for better surveillance, better uh, uh, education for people to be aware of what the disease symptoms are and so on. The next disease we're going to discuss is dengue virus. Uh, dengue is one of the major problems um, in the developing world, uh, in the tropics specifically. Approximately 2.5 billion people live under the threat of dengue. Here you can see that it pretty much includes every continent um, and includes um, basically at the entire level of the tropics. You'll see dengue as one of the major neglected tropical diseases that is mentioned that there's a huge focus for developing drugs and vaccines for. Uh, there's currently a couple of vaccines in the pipeline that are, that are uh, getting far in, I think, into stage two, stage three range, so it's moving forward, but it's got a complex life cycle and pretty, pretty complex problems. It's spread by a viral disease, uh, unlike the others that were uh, parasitic, um, and there's four subtypes of it, so, and the disease profile is fairly complex. If you get bitten by one, um, one subtype, you can get what's called the dengue fever, which is also called breakbone fever. If it occurs in two forms, if you get a second infection, you can develop what's called dengue hemorrhagic fever, which is actually life-threatening. Um, the dengue fever is severe and flu-like illness. It's probably one of the worst flus you ever had. Um, they often call it breakbone fever. Um, and the hemorrhagic is a more severe form, which can cause death. Basically, you can actually start to hemorrhage internally uh, from the disease itself. Control strategy, a lot like the others, is uh, community awareness, involvement, um, but also it, areas, issues like trying to reduce the amount of breeding areas that the mosquito can live in. Um, unlike the malaria parasite, uh, mosquito, forgive me, um, the Aedes aegypti um, can actually, what it, it, breeds in little small ponds, so if you, or even small cups of water, or small, you know, like little tiny uh, crevices in plants. So if you can actually remove them by just turning over like pots that have water standing in it, you can actually reduce the amount of breeding areas quite considerably. Um, depending on the country, some countries actually have programs that are much stronger. Cuba, for instance, had a very strong dengue 
um, elimination program, and they were actually able to eliminate it by basically telling everyone, you know, turn over the tires, turn over the water cups, turn over any pots that you have. If you have any standing water, um, try to spread it out and, and let it let it let it spill out. Um, countries like that can actually force the people. So there are some some uh, ways that you can say that maybe you know the communist idea for that type of thing is a little bit better than giving people the free right to say, well, if you don't want to. Um, I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but it was effective, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and then also vector control, spread, spraying, just as I mentioned before, early diagnosis and capacity building. The next disease we're going to discuss is yellow fever. Uh, yellow fever is also a viral disease. Um, it's also related to the dengue fever. Uh, it's in the same family. Um, but it can be seen in, in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa and many places, as well as South, South America. Yellow fever is a dangerous infection um, whose prevalence is around the world has been greatly reduced due to the availability of a vaccine. The vaccine is very effective. Um, many of you may have even had this vaccine. They used to say that it was uh, valid for 10 years, and new studies are showing that it's, uh, that it's effective, the vaccine is effective for your entire life. So um, the WHO changed the recommendations. However, a lot of countries are slow to actually move this on. So um, if you've had the vaccine more than 10 years ago, you might need a booster even still. Um, having said that, hopefully soon uh, they'll be able to develop even a stronger vaccine um, that can guarantee lifelong uh, immunity. Uh, the yellow fever uh, virus is transmitted by, again, by mosquitoes. There's our ever-present mosquito. And it's usually found in rural areas um, Typically, the uh, monkeys serve as the main host. Not always. Uh, there can be a lot of different areas. And the, the trees that the monkeys stay in, you know, with, like I mentioned before, they can be in like the little cracks and crevices of the tree limbs, um, so they can serve as the breeding areas. So it is a very, very localized uh, disease. Um, however, it does cause a lot of problems. In persons who develop symptoms, the incubation period is usually about three to six days. The initial symptoms are fairly generic, um, includes fever, chills, uh, headache, back pain, um, body aches, so you might not differentiate it from a flu. Uh, however, if you don't get treated soon, um, or if you don't get uh, uh, cared for soon, um, it can actually end up leading into a much more severe case where you can get jaundice, bleeding, and eventual shock, and, and uh, multiple organ failure and death. There's no treatments available, um, so the major uh, way you can deal with it is supportive care, trying to under close observation. So if you have it, um, your likelihood of getting severely ill are there. But if you're under good hospital care, you might, you should be able to come out of it. Um, but it will be a very long ordeal for you. The next disease we're going to discuss about is Chagas disease. The last disease we're going to discuss today is Chagas disease. Um, Chagas is found primarily in the in the Americas. Um, it, there are cases now actually in the United States, um, but it has historically been Central South America. Um, the cases in the United States are, are uh, a lot of people are concerned is a problem with either um, transportation from Central and South America, but also climate change. Uh, a lot of the cases that are being described now are native cases in the United States, in Texas, and in South Florida, um, which is concerning a lot of people. But for the purposes of the uh, this course, I just wanted to focus mostly on the developing countries in Central and South America, where the majority of the cases are. Um, as you can see, in Brazil has a huge number of cases, as well as Mexico uh, and Argentina. Um, Chagas disease is caused by a parasite called Trypanosoma cruzi, um, which is found mostly in Latin America, but it's also transmitted by a uh, bug called the Reduvit bug, or also known as the kissing bug. I'd mentioned before uh, why it's called that. Um, the disease mainly threatens those uh, that live in houses with thatched roofs. They tend to hide, the bugs tend to live in the thatched roofing. So indoor residential spraying um, uh, is, a, is a clear way that you can do it, deal with it. Or a lot of the new techniques is using um, metal tin roofs uh, can prevent the bugs from uh, entering into the household. The disease has a unique uh, um, acute and a chronic phase. Um, if left untreated, it can cause lifelong infection, but the acute phase usually occurs immediately after infection and may last up to a couple of weeks to months in which the parasite uh, can be found in the circulating blood. Um, the infection tends to be mild or is asymptomatic, but you can develop a fever or swelling at the site of the, in, uh, the, site of the inoculation where the bug actually bites. 
um, and enter, allows the parasite to enter the skin. Um, following the acute phase, most people are infected, uh, enter into a prolonged asymptomatic phase, uh, the chronic in, um, intermittent phase. It's during this period that there's no parasites found in the blood, um, and most people become unaware that they have an infection. You can then develop later on a um, uh, prolonged chronic phase in which you get uh, relapses of problems such as uh, uh, heart problems. You can get uh, chronic heart problems tends to be one of the biggest problems that are associated with Chagas, but also a lot of other things. Um, during the acute phase, uh, prescription drug medications um, such as uh, ben benzino uh, ben benzinol is yeah, forget it. Uh, you can read it. <laughs> um, God, I'm not. I'm not a physician, so these drug names are a murder. But anyway, um, you could, there are drugs available for these. Uh, they tend to be fairly, yeah, less less harsh than the other drugs. Um, some that we mentioned before, but they do have their own side effects and can be a problem. So now that I talked about some of the uh, introduction to some of these infectious diseases, so how do you actually control uh, vector-borne diseases? And we would go back to the pyramid of transmission in which you can either you know, uh, focus on the agent, the host, or the environment, as well as the transmission between the agent and the host. Uh, the first thing you can do is change the environment. This is probably the easiest way to deal with it. Um, is to do environmental things such as um, flipping over trash cans and garbage that has standing water. Um, you can do environmental things like uh, residential spraying, um, so on, things like that. Uh, so that is probably for preventing it, it's probably the easiest way, especially for mosquitoes. Some of the other diseases might be more of a challenge. For instance, the snails for cystosomiasis, uh, you have to use large amounts of pesticide. Um, in China, it, it goes as, to the extent that they're actually uh, using concrete over rivers um, to prevent the, the, the reeds from growing, to prevent the snails, which prevents the schisto. It's an extreme measure, but uh, it is one of the ways that you can change the environment. You can also change the host. Um, the, you could take prophylaxis. There's a lot of anti-malarial prophylactic drugs out there that, you can, that, that are available. Um, especially during high-risk periods like in early childhood or during pregnancy. Um, you can uh, have them get prompt medical evaluations as soon as the earliest signs uh, show up. And then genetic engineering or biological uh, manipulation. Um, not so much in the humans, but the idea of that is more like the idea of vaccine development. Um, that, that would be an example of biological manipulation. Um, you can also change the transmission patterns. Uh, using bed nets is one of the best ways, um, especially for those who are susceptible. If you wear a bed net, if you're having a bed and sleeping under a bed net uh, during the evening, the uh, mosquitoes are unlikely to bite. But also things like mosquito repellent um, and mosquito traps in the environment. You can also change the agent. Um, not as easy to do uh, by changing the actual mosquito, the agent being the, the vector, um, but you can, um, there are new methods of vaccinating mosquitoes. They are things that they can do in which the vaccinated mosquitoes are, um, uh, they're sterile, so they won't be able to reproduce. So if you, you know, populate the environment with them, they are less, and they get the, the uh, parasite, they're more less likely to be able to transmit the parasite uh, from generation to generation. Um, and so, I mean, those are very new methods and, and they're not easy to do. Uh, with that, it's really the end of the discussion uh, for today. Uh, I know there's a lot of diseases that I haven't touched on, but it, I could, the, there could be an endless discussion on this one. Um, and I'd be happy to have any of you that are willing to do uh, one of the ones that I haven't discussed for your presentations um, to present to the rest of the class. Uh, I'm willing and happy to hear it. Anyway, uh, have a good week. Talk to you soon.